Uh, okay, everybody. Our final talk of the conference is Michel, our illustrious host, and he's going to tell us about the prism of intrinsic mirror symmetry. Um, Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, speaking of prism, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as a homework to figure out where the prism shows up. And, and, and maybe there'll be like a lot of interesting answers, like like what Tim said about the prism. I actually didn't think about that, but that's perfect. No, no, that's totally perfect. I loved it. So maybe there, there's some other ways. So I'm going to use your creative intelligence to figure out other ways that the prism shows up in my talk. I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for um to Alan and Tyler for making this workshop happening happen. There, you know, if you you're here thanks to you know using something that costs money, you have both of them to think for it. All right, and then and then very importantly, most importantly, there's no successful con. I mean, I didn't get you a coffee because I, I really wanted you to be like tired and sleepy on my talk. But there was something really exciting afterwards, which is we're gonna go climbing. So everyone uh, um, should join and uh, it's after the conference. So, you know, we don't take responsibility for what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but so the information is on the on the website and we'll, we'll i mean you know we'll probably be there by 4 or 4 30 or something and, and it'll be fun you know we'll, you can you can try to climb if you've never done it you can watch people climb if, if that's what you want and then we'll go for a beer or something all right so um and thank you all for coming despite the strikes and everything and so today i'm gonna um talk about the prism of mirror or no oops. I'm going to talk about the prism of mirror symmetry, which is which you will tell me what it is at the end. So, so first of all, let's make a few comments about uh, mirror symmetry. Um, so, how how does one learn mirror symmetry? And certainly, that's the way I kind of learned about it. Is there's supposed to be this sort of a side? There's like an a side, whatever that means. On the a side, we usually have some symplectic manifold. Really, it's always an economic. A, a, a smooth algebraic variety, but it also has a dual life as a symplectic manifold. Um, it, it will have dimension n. And in fact, today we'll be interested in pairs y comma d, where y is a smooth final variety and d is a smooth anti-canonical divisor. So for example, the, the prototypical example that um, Tim introduced earlier today is P2 with E a elliptic curve. And so you should think of what we're really trying to study here. If 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 pairs make you uncomfortable, you can think of the complement. Yeah. So we're trying to do mirror symmetry for something which is open Calabria. Okay. And then on the so that's the geometry of the A side. And then there's something that maybe people call a model, uh, which are some symplectic A side invariants, which are these like Gromov written invariants counting curves. So I just want to like. I don't want to say too much about this. Um, Tim did introduce it. Like, remember these like flex slides that, that we've seen, but it's just something very we care about. And so all we should note is that this is something very difficult to compute, something symplectic, something difficult. Yeah. So that's the A side. And then there's a B side. So on the B side, we have some sort of family, typically of Calabria manifolds. The family will be over something it may some maybe we want to write down this just a1 for, for the purpose of today it's going to be a disk so if you remember mark's talk um he had this like um spec of the completion of c of p so that's the sort of thing that could be lying here but for us we'll just think about it as a disk um yeah a little disk so so what what in algebraic geometry means that global functions here are kind of um, analytic functions defined in around zero. Okay. And then, so that's the geometry of the B side. What are the invariants of the B side? Well, the invariants of the B side are these period functions, um, which are which are not really functions because they're multi-valued, but for the purposes of today, we may as well think of them as functions. So they go from the disk, from the base of our family to C, or whatever, and then um, they'll they'll have the shape that t goes to the integral over some cycle gamma of the holomorphic volume form of x of um, of of x of t. Okay, so this is something complex geometric. 
we take a cycle which has a whose class lives in h of n so middle dimensional um, homology we have this homomorphic volume form we integrate over it that defines a function it is multi-valued because typically it's, it's going to be something like log to the k plus the holomorphic part so as we go around the origin there'll be some monotony yeah okay yeah. any questions so far so we have a a side geometry we have some a side invariants we have a b side geometry and we have some b side invariants yeah okay and now 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 let's do some mirror symmetry so, so i think maybe this slide comes afterwards so um there are if you read articles about mirror symmetry very typically you'll find like two different types of results that people pursue one is no construction this is you start with some y or some pair yd, for example, um, like our team was explaining to us, p2, e, and then you construct the mirror, um, exactly as, as Tim was doing it earlier today. You could also start with some Calabria, compact Calabria, whatever. But here your goal is to construct the other side. So if you remember from um, Tim's talk, in the beginning, he motivated it um, from, the, from the point of view of the SYZ conjunction. And it was like this, this like um, discrete Legendre transform. Anyway, so you construct the mirror. And um, now maybe the most versatile, uh, most general construction uh, we have in our arsenal of mirror symmetry constructions is intrinsic mirror symmetry, which was developed by Grossi. And so what Tim was talking about was kind of the old version of this. I mean, not old, but <laughs> the kind of original version of this. And and then this intrinsic mirror symmetry is, is a little bit simpler. Um, and maybe more intuitive, but it's it's the same thing, just just described in different terms. All right, so far so good. And so someone told me uh, once, then when I give a, a talk, I should emphasize a few key points. So that's what I want to try to do now. So one key input is in order to build this mirror family, we're gonna. Oh, now is my my big slide. Okay. So key takeaways. Yeah. So some key things to remember so that you can forget everything else. So the first thing to remember is that I'm going to be doing the B side of Tim's talk. And you know, as, as I specifically explained in the abstract, both sides are equivalent, hopefully. Um, and then the, the the one of the key takeaways is so this is um uh this is docking on where what Ben said yesterday. Sometimes you, you can spend your career like computing one invariant after the other, but it turns out it's much better to just compute a generating function. Because somehow the generating function has a lot of extra properties that the individual invariants don't see. So you can somehow the difficulty, so the oftentimes computing the generating, generating functions is easier because you, you can use properties of multiplication and addition, which you, you don't have if you generate the individual invariants. So, so that's one thing. But even today, we're going, going to go a little bit further because we're, we're not just looking at the generating function of the invariants we care about. We're going to like look at some sort of mega extended generating function. So we add much more stuff, stuff that we don't even care about, and we put this in a geom in a geometric gener generating function. Yeah, which is exactly that thing here. So this key input, which is that we're going to build our mirror family by like throwing in all these one pointed um, geometric invariants, the ones that Mark mentioned in his talk. Okay, so to, maybe to connect uh, to Tim's result. Um, to Tim's talk, he has this this beautiful geometric tropical manifold, and then he has these tropical curves. And so, what they do in intrinsic mirror symmetry, they they build this tropical manifold, and they throw in all the like all the tropical curves all in at once, and even much more. Not just the ones we care about, but many more. And and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll show you how that works in a bit. So we 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 have an invariant we really care about. We add the ones Tim talked about, we add in a bunch more invariants, and then out of this, we'll be able to extract the invariants we care about. Okay, uh, hopefully that will become um, a little bit clearer. So, so that's mere construction. Any questions so far? Then the other thing that people really like to do is mirror theorem, yeah? So mirror theorem is saying that the invariants of one side Corresponds to the invariance of the other side. It's a little bit like a magical black box. Yeah? 
So we have, remember at the very beginning, we have an A side geometry, some A side invariants. We have a B side geometry, some B side invariants. Two questions how do you build the B side geometry and how do you relate the invariants? Mirror construction, you build the B side geometry. Mirror theorem, you show they are equivalent. Yeah? And this equivalence can take several forms. And now I'm mentioning one, which was conjectured by uh, Nobuyoshi Takahashi um, more than 20 years ago, which is that, well, on the mirror family 2P2, there should be some spe specific cycle. And then when you integrate over it in a spe special coordinate, somehow this like generating function is supposed to pop out. Yeah. Maybe I'll pause for one second. So we have a mirror family and then we take a cycle on it. You know, it, as here, we have some sort of specific cycle gamma on which is, you know, gamma lives inside the, the mirror family here. Okay. We have a mirror family, we have a cycle. We integrate over it and then we vary T. So that gives us a function on the disk. And then the conjecture by Nobuyoshi Takashi is that that function um, can be written as a term of a term in log square and then a more I don't know, holomorphic term where the coefficients are these invariants. These are the endies that Tim talked about. Um, there's, there's a little caveat here, which is that Q should be a special coordinate, but this ties in with the mirror map. That being said, when you do uh, sorry, intrinsic mirror symmetry, the mirror map is, is, is monomial, so you don't need to care about this transformation at all. So did I already lose everyone? Um, I, I want you to leave today's meeting with like a bitter aftertaste. So. It's my goal. Any questions? All right. So, 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 so let's. So today I'm talking about joint work with um, Helge Rudat and Ben Siebert. It's partially in progress, meaning that I mean the structure is there, but there's some details to yeah. just uh, figure out. Um, generally, we start with y d, which is y is just a smooth fun of variety. D is a smooth anti canonical divisor. You may as well think about p two um, comma e. And then there's this input of a toy degeneration of y comma d, which um, Tim um, explained what it is. Maybe we just leave this as a, as, as a, as a technical box, um, but that's that you need this in order for toy pieces to appear. Then we built the intrinsic mirror, and here, um, here I am. Uh, here you can think of, so. So if you're taking a file of any dimension, then you should build the intrinsic mirror using um, intrinsic mirror symmetry. But then if you're in dimension two, you can use um, Tim's paper. So in dimension two, we can do this. So dimension two uh, using Tim or Griffin. When you say why not linear, like when you need the part pieces, you mean that why not have to be correct and then do not also have to be um, good question. Thank you. So I mean that it's a, so it's a, a um, the decomposition of the central fiber into irreducible components. So you, you decompose the central fiber into irreducible, irreducible components, and you'll have several. And each piece is going to be toric, mm -hmm. and then each G is going to be um, a toric device in it, but not necessarily the full toric boundary. So if you remember from Tim's, uh, okay. not necessarily. So remember in Tim's talk. Um, we had, um, let's use nice, I don't know what, what non C colors, so they are almost not that you can see that. So we have, you know, we had this thing here. So, so you know, each piece was a P113, but then the, like, we only had this divisor, this divisor, and this divisor. So we didn't have the full toy, toy part. But that, that's what we need. Yeah. Um, so you need this because. If you want to write down the dual intersection complex or intersection complex, and that you want this to be polytope or fan or whatever, so you really need something toric to get your hands on. But that's those are these maximally unipotent 
um, degenerations that Mark was telling us about. So we, we expect them to exist. They may, they may be hard to construct, but we expect them to exist. More questions? All right. So, so I said you can either, as a definition of the mirror family, you can use um, um, what Tim told us about, or you can just like throw it in the machine, in the intrinsic mirror machine. Um, so we have a B is going to be the dual intersection complex, which was, so the dual intersection complex in Tim's talk was this thing here. Yeah, with the, there's like some, some like uh, singularities, some focus focus singularities that we had to cut out here, here, and here. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then there was a, uh, well, polyhedral decomposition, which is, uh, you know, the one you get by looking at the different chambers. And there's a piecewise affine function, which I'm just ignoring. Um, and then here's, so the way that Tim presented his talk is he constructs the degeneration, he builds the dual intersection complex, and then he, he lets scattering go wild. He like turns on scattering and da -da 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 -da, something something happens, right? So so that's that's the way um, you do it in the like older versions. But if you do intrinsic mirror which you do it slightly different. You say you write down everything at once <laughs> using um, these using these um, punctured invariants. So so we have this beautiful diagram which is um, stolen from Tim's website. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, so. So this is this is the picture that Tim Tim talked about. Just just like turned around. So we have um, uh, we have here we have these. Um, so this is uh, um, so this is uh, I don't know what, what's it called. Uh, this is a fundamental domain for the for for the tropical manifold, and and then you have these. You can see. So this is a sage code that you can find on Tim's website. And then you can do it degree by degree. And then here you start seeing the tropical curves. So this, this is, these are the, I mean, as Tim explained to us, these are the three, um, the three uh, tropical curves. And then degree two curves, you have like, for example, this one, also um, Tim mentioned this one, but you have a bunch of others and you can all see them here. Um, and then degree three, you can st you start seeing the scattering. I mean, this is only degree three and it's already pretty complicated. And so when I run, I think I run degree four, and I think that that was done in maybe 10 minutes or 50 minutes. And then degree five for my laptop took maybe 40, 50 minutes. I haven't tried degree six. How far have you have you gone? Six is two hours. Okay. Two hours. And then I don't know. I after, see. After I wanted to take that. I see. Oh, degree seven <laughs> was. Seven, oh, wow. I see. I see. Okay. So, anyways. Um, um, so, so that's what it looks like. And you can see um, basically here, what you can see here is um, the scattering process. You do it degree by degree. And then each time it becomes more complicated and you, you start seeing this, this like scattering um, stuff happening everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah. Um, so an alternative way of doing this, which is how intrinsic mirror symmetry does it, is it just, um, builds everything at once. Like it builds something else out of these punctured logarithm invariants, which, which construct all these tropical curves all at once on the thing. And so there's no, I mean, so somehow you're skipping scattering. You just, you just right away say, well, that's a tropical curve, you know, and, and it has that wall crossing function. You say that, you know, this one here, this really complicated one, blah, blah, blah. This is a tropical curve and it has a wall crossing function given by the, Punctured invariant. Yeah. Whereas what Tim was doing is like applying the algorithm step by step. But it, it all should be equivalent. All right. Um, and then the last comment is that uh, no, that D being smooth means that um, this tropical manifold is asymptot asymptotically cylindrical. More questions or any questions? So here, the prism that uh, uh, Tim introduced, which is, um, so we have this one way of viewing the whatever tropical manifold is, it looks like this thing here. And then you can start finding tropical curves in it like this one, yeah? 
And you can see the comment I just made. If you started with a D which was smooth, and Tim mentioned it as well, then V is asymptotically cylindrical. So you can see that, I mean, there's one infinite direction. And what this completely means is you have one affine coordinate, which is why you get a family over the disk. So like one direction. And then to each, each tropical curve carries a wall crossing function, which is some um, Taylor series expansion. And, and this is, you know, it has two, um, it's a Taylor series expansion in two variable. T is the smoothing parameter and then Z to the U, U is the tangent direction or Z to the minus U, the Z. I mean, up to some conventions. Um, and then Tim's result is that in one of his results, if you take the product over the asymptotically vertical walls, then you get this, um, well, well, you get the generating function of these log chromatic log invariants, where W is the vertical um, monomial. And then this tropical correspondence with these maximal tangency um, log chromatic invariants counting curves that meet the elliptic curve in one point of maximum tangents. Questions? Let's go back to a beautiful picture. Um, maybe to interest the physicists in the audience, this thing is equivalent to a slice of the space of bridge and stability conditions of local KP2, that's worked by Busso. And then all of these rays, um, they define, um, so you can associate to all of these rays, a function which has some DT invariants associated to the specific conditions. Um, and then doing this, you can compute DT invariants of like quivers and stuff. This is work by Busso. I'm right, just trying to make a connection since you care about these things, all right? Um, Okay, so, so what did I explain? So I, I kind of gave you a quick overview of, of Tim's talk, where I, um, I said that, well, this can be done more generally at uh, using intrinsic mirror symmetry. Um, yeah. And now comes the question. So, so you, we have, let's say we have built this mirror family so what's the B model? Because mirror symmetry is supposed to be A equals B. Um, Tim explained to us what is A. I mean, he, he showed us A corresponds to tropical curves. So what's the thing on the B side that corresponds back to the thing at the A side we had, yeah? So what do we do on the B side? Such that we get a result that the invariant on the B side computes the invariant on the A side. So we expect on the B side to have some period functions. So remember these functions, these multi-valued functions on the disk that go from the disk to C, um, given by integrating a holomorphic volume form over some cycle. Yeah. And now, I mean, the option of Tim's talk is you care about some invariants. Well, you translate them into some, you care about an invariant that is counting curves. Well, you translate that into an invariant that's counting tropical curves. You count the tropical curve invariants, yeah? So we wanna go now, we wanna take this and go to the B side, yeah? So what should the B side be? Well, of course, it's gonna be something in terms of tropical cycles, yeah? So the key idea is that this, um, this, this cycle you're integrating over, um, should be a should be fiber or some, some tropical K cycles in. So it should have admit a vibration over some tropical K cycles in. So so let me try to explain what I, what, what I mean by this. So this is our B here. Okay, this one, um, and then being fibered in. S1 to the n minus k, well, 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 it could mean several things. So first you could be fibered over a point. Yeah? 
So if you have five over a point, then gamma is just S1 to the N, five over, that, that's what you get, right? Well, if you take an S1 to some product vibration of a point, it just can be S1 to some product. And that product should be, I mean, it should be dimension N pink. Yeah. Yeah, so I take a point on my on my D and I and I look at something which is phi within S1 to the N over it, which has to be S1 to the N. Yeah. There's no choice. Um, so that is just S1 to the N. I can integrate over it. So it's the integral over S1 to the N of the holomorphic volume form. And um, that's just using the residue theorem that's two pi i to the N. We're integrating one over x around the little loop around the origin. The residue theorem tells us that this is two pi i. Yeah. Very good. So that's that's the degree zero cycle. So this is a cycle which is fibered over tropical zero cycle. Okay. Now let's look at a cycle which is fibered over a tropical one cycle. So this is work by um, Rudat and Siebert, it was also mentioned in Mark's talk. Sorry. Yes? What is N? How does it depend on the, the dimension? How does it depend on the value of the A cycle? Um, it's a dimension of the, so we so we, we started with X comma D, yeah. and then N is a dimension of X. Okay, so I'm sorry, Y comma D. We started with Y comma D. Okay, so, so this is the general case, it's not P2. Correct. Yeah, so, 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 all my drawings are for P2, but it just works in general. Um, and, um, but yeah, so it's, we start with something of dimension. Um, and yeah, more, other, more questions? All right. So, so now let's look at the next case. So k equals one, it means we'll have something which is fibered over a tropical one cycle. What is a tropical one cycle? Well, it's, you can define what it is, but it's almost the same thing as a tropical curve. Yeah. I mean, of course, a cycle, you're supposed to be able to wiggle things around and you are, but every tropical curve determines a, sorry, every tropical curve determines a tropical one cycle. So let's take that as a definition for today. So we take this tropical curve here, and then we have something which is fibered in S1 over it. So it just looks like this weird thing here. <laughs> and, and, and what I wanna say is you can, you can really construct this because, um, so what is this map? Well, this is something like the Mormon map. So each of these, each of these um, polytopes is something like the Mormon polytope. And then you have the Mormon map. And if you have a tropical curve in the Mormon map, then you can lift um, you can lift it up to something which is fibered um, in S1 over that thing. Um, and and, and it maybe it seems like a complicated thing, but it's not. Yeah. Um, because, because of the structure, if you if, because of the, the structure of the moment map. Yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't take long to explain, but, but since I haven't prepared it, I'll probably get it wrong, so. Um, yeah. But you can think of like, you have like this, you have, I mean, on the moment polytope, you have local coordinates, which correspond to local coordinates on your variety. Yeah, they're, they're kind of the real coordinates. And then, so here you, you, you set, you have one, one direction, which corresponds to real direction upstairs. Well, and then you take the orthogonal direction and here, um, well, you just take a little circle in the complex direction and, that, and that's your vibration. And yeah, okay. And so I, I've, I've drawn in here for dimension two, but you can do it in any dimension. And then the theorem of Rudat and Siebert is that, well, if you integrate omega, the homomorphic volume form over this cycle gamma, then the result, is something rather explicit. Um, there's like a term here, which is some sort of um, um, product between some gluing data and the tropical curve. Now, usually the gluing data is just chosen to be trivial. So that thing is, I mean, it probably could be some power series in T, 
but it's just going to be some, I mean, just some number in general. Like you choose trivial ruling data, which is what you should do anyways, uh, or in most cases. And then so you just get some number times t to some power, and that's like some topological data. So, so this is, this is the, so this is the, okay. So if you had now this computation in the setting of like but you have goals of mirror symmetry would have given you the inverse of the mirror. Yeah? But we already in sort of good coordinates, so-called canonical coordinates, which tells us that this computation is just monomial in T. Yeah. And that's just because we, we do Grossiever, then we don't do, I don't know, battery or something. Like that. That's one of the key features of the Grossiever program is you can forget about the mirror map. I, I don't know if you if that's a site of relief for you or not, but, but you, don't, you don't have to care about the mirror map because uh, it's just, yeah, this result tells you that it's going to be monomial. So this is this, this oh, oops. These are these canonical coordinates. Okay. No homomorphic part is just monomial. Any questions? Okay. So 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 just a quick recap. So we 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 we're trying to figure out what's the B model of on our intrinsic mirror family, and then um, our first somehow natural idea is. We should look at some some we should look at some cycles, some n cycles in the family, some real n cycles, and they should be fibered over some tropical data. Yeah. So they should be fibered over like tropical k cycles where k is either zero, one, two, three, whatever. And if we know, and our kind of I don't know, the conjecture is that if you know all of them, then you know all the A models. Yeah. So our work is about k equals two. So we don't go beyond k equals two. Um, certainly would be interesting to have that. Um, so we just do k equals two. For this, we have some extra structure, um, which is we have a global function. And you know, if you're looking at this at this thing here, so I told you you should think of each of the pieces like the moment polytope. And um, locally around the point, you have that gives you coordinates on your variety, on your toric variety. I mean, it's a deformation there, but let's ignore that. Um, and you can see that, well, I mean, being projective means that your polytope is, is bounded. Right? Um, and having some, some affine or infinite directions means, well, you have some infinite directions. So you can see here that there's exactly one direction. Um, which is unbounded, the vertical direction, and in that direction, you that, that's that's why you, are, um, yeah, you have some like yeah, unbounded direction. And so this is this is this function w that comes from this direction. It is a global function. It's defined everywhere. As you can see, I can this 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 ray is defined everywhere, and it gives us a global function. And this gives us a Calabi-Yau vibration of this x t. So now someone's supposed to ask, is that the superpotential? Who wants to ask? Oh, thank you for asking. That's a great question. <laughs> it's not the superpotential. Um, in fact, uh, so, so it's related to the superpotential by an uh, operation which is analogous to the mirror map. So this is my slide for, this is my remark for Kazim. So in everything I do now, if you replace little w by super potential, you get the quasi map invariance, which is really cool. Yeah. So, so we, there's like this other theory of quasi map invariance, and, and it like wall crosses to go in theory. And the way you see this here is you either choose as a global function your little w, or you choose as a global function your, your super potential. And depending on which one you choose, you have this coordinate transformation, which is analogous to the mirror map that turn, goes from quasi map to normal invariance. Parenthesis closed. 
but it's a cool thing. All right. So, so we this little W gives us this Colabia vibration, and then this is a result in um, CPS, Carl Pumpala Siebert. Let's use this color. No, that's a CPS color. So this is CPS. So that uh, um, the preimage of one. So you can you know you, you can have so the preimage of one gives you something in here, and then you also still have this T parameter. So you do have a family over the disk, and that's the mirror family 2D, but not quite, because it's a deformed mirror family. And that's very important. It's a deformed mirror family. So this means that there is some gluing data, S, which is not trivial. So it's not equal one. Yeah. So remember we had this gluing data, which I just mentioned in passing uh, here. And, and in, in, in that case, that gluing data is not equal to one. And, and, I, and I can actually explain to you what, what, what this gluing data is. And, and that's where, where, we, where we, that's how we proved um, um, our correspondence, or sorry, our, that's how we compute our periods. I haven't told you how it works, but I can, I can show you. So here is, um, so this, pr this prismatic picture um, that Tim introduced. And then we, we, we know that is, it is asymptotically cylindrical. So there, there is this sort of like projection to, to this one. And as Tim explained, this is the, this is the base of the elliptic curve. You really did a great job <laughs> explaining everything I need here. Okay. But we can do something more. So we have these, we have these, these, these tropical curves that carry some wall crossing functions. So here I just wrote down what it is in intrinsic mirror symmetry, where um, these are these, uh, you know, this is like the, um, these punctured invariants. So we have these generating functions. Um, and then what we can do is we can take these and we can kind of project it onto here. So, in this projection, we just set W to one. Yeah, we have this, this monomial, which has been set to one. So there are two things that can happen. Either you have something which is vertical. Um, and then if you, I mean, if it's vertical, that, that, that means it's gonna be some power series in W. And if you set W equals to one, it's just you know, gonna be a power series only in T. So that's the first case. So here we get these undirected walls. Or you could have something which is um, like, just, just gives you an, a, a usual wall because somehow something that survives the quotient. I mean, you can think of you have some big lattice and then you quotient out by one direction and then you get another element. It's, or you could have something that survives and that gives you a usual directed wall. And I, I think we, Tim and I agreed over lunch that in the case of P2, you, you don't even see that, but, but in higher dimensions, you do see it. Because in higher dimensions, that thing is going to be the oops. That thing is going to be the the like tropical manifold for like a, in. So if you go up one dimension, it's going to be the tropical manifold of a K-free surface, and that's definitely going to have non-trivial wall structure. Otherwise, Mark's talk this morning wouldn't have made any sense. Yeah, um, and then yeah. All right. Well, let, let me say that one more time. So in in this picture here, so we have all these tropical curves, and you have a bunch of curves which go in undesirable directions, but they, they do carry some wall crossing functions. Um, and then you have the ones which are vertical. And what happens is if you quotient to this asymptotic picture here, then only those here will survive. In high dimensions, they will, I mean, all of them will survive, but they'll be of a different flavor. So those which are vertical, they become just um, undirected walls and, and the rest become just regular walls. Yeah? To finality order, yes, because the way it becomes different, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, think about it because they somehow exist there in the, in the big picture. Well, I mean, so they are like, they are really non existent. Yeah, so what we, I mean, so that's right. So what we, in this picture, in dimension two, we can just say we cut off at some T order. And then we do everything up to cutting off as a T order, 
And then in the period computation, what this means is we just compute the period up to some order. And then, you know, if we want, we can compute one more and one more, one more, right? Um, but, but in some, some sense, that comment is, is more important for higher dimensions. Because in higher dimensions, these here will not die. I mean, some might die, but, but, but they will not die. And there's a very simple reason because in higher dimensions, when you take this projection, you're going to get the um, tropical manifold associated to like a K3 surface or compact Calabria. And these have no trigger walls, right? And it would be if, yeah, they, they must have it because what is this, right? We have in our setup, we don't just have, we don't just have a, you know, on the A side, we don't just have one family that varies. Um, sorry. If you're looking at mirror symmetry of the elliptic curve or of the K3 surface of the D, the D, right? That D does it inside. So we look, you can, so mirror symmetry of that D in this context is an embedded D, right? So it's not the same as mirror symmetry for an abstract D. That's why we have this correction factors, these S. Yeah, there's this gluing data, which you see because you're looking at an embedded D. Yeah, so it's kind of like it mix, there's a mixture between. You know, you're doing Pano mirror symmetry, but also locks, Calabiao with smooth boundary, but also you're doing um, Calabiao mirror symmetry. Many, many things come in here. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. Or other, other comments? Yeah, you know, on the scattering diagram, yeah. sometimes the scattering meet various points. Yeah, yeah. So what, what do they signify? Oh, that's, you know, that's an excellent question, but that, that there's just no time to go into that. Um, so this is this thing that Tim was saying. You, you you have each function carries an automorphism group, and then when you go around the point, um, basically that automor like that automorphism should become the identity if you just go around the point. For example, um, this point here, and then the process of scattering is that well you cut off some t order, and then you go around and you realize you didn't have, you don't, you, you don't have, I mean, you don't have the identity. So you add a bunch of rays so that you get the identity and then you go around one more time. And, and sorry, then you, you increase the order by one, you go around one more time and still you don't have the identity. So you have to add a bunch of rays. You think next time it's going to work, but next time you cross, there's even more walls to add and you just keep going. That's why it's like, that's why we're doing everything over the disk and not over like uh, the affine line. Because we have this, yeah. Anyways, but it's a good question. All right. Uh, other other questions? Yeah. Um, then the, the other thing I want to say is so what I mentioned about why it's really important that we don't just look at the generating function, but we look at an extended generating function is that we really want to in high dimensions we really want to throw in all these functions in there. So even though we may not care about them, we need all of them. And there's a very simple reason for this, which is that um, when you think about the duality between co-characters and characters, you may not think about this, but that's kind of a, this, this is kind of a mirror symmetry thing. Because co-characters are something like maps from C star to C star to the end. Those are symplectic maps. Those are symplectic cylinders, yeah? Characters, on the other hand, that's something algebraic. Those are functions, monomial functions. So here we have some sort of correspondence between um, symplectic cylinders and monomial functions. And um, yeah, so and in some sense, all that this stuff is about is to extend this to every possible case you can ever imagine. That's, that's what we're doing, yeah. And so if that's what we're doing, then we should be looking at every possible cylinder that we have. And that's exactly why we throw in all the punctured invariants. So we need to have every possible symplectic cylinder that may occur. We need to throw it in the mix. I mean, I should say symplectic disks, but so we throw in all the all the disks that we have in the mix. And once we have everything, we can get out what we want. So yeah. So that's why we need not just a generating function, but we need an extended generating function. And for us, we have this sort of geometric extended generating function, which is this tropical manifold. We think of it as a generating function where we have all these kind of punctured invariants arranged in an interesting way. And out of this, we're going to get the thing we really care about. All right. So, so okay, to go back, so we, we, we have this projection. Uh, and then um, S is the product over the vertical ones. 
So the so the, the the product of the ones the walls here that don't have a direction, which is equivalent to uh, they having they came from a vertical wall inside B, um, which is equivalent that uh, this invariance contributes to maximal tangents invariance. So basically, it, it really selects all the ones we care about in order to then get the invariance we start with. So, so it's, it, this is um, what Tim Tim's result that you sum over all tropical functions with a multiplicity and you get the invariant you want. Here we're summing over all these punctured invariants, all sorry, we're, we're summing over all possible tropical curves. They have a multiplicity which is given by these punctured invariants. And then um, once we take everything together, we'll get uh, when, once we sum it up, we get invariants we want. All right. So what is our tropical two cycle? Remember that's I'm, I'm supposed to tell you something about tropical two cycles. So we have this map W. So here up here we have XT. Yeah? And so we have W. So if XT is phi, but so W gives it a Clavier vibration. Yeah? So this is you know one fiber may look like this, one fiber may look like this. So we take uh, points on the positive real line A B. We look at the fibers above them. Okay. Then we choose a tropical one cycle in the tropical manifold associated with T. For example, we could just take this one. So, so more precisely, we, we want to take uh, tropical cycles that come from curves in D of, of some class. Yeah. So we want to we take some tropicalization of the curve. Um, we, inside D. So this tropical one cycle um, defines using some stuff I explained before, it defines a um, N minus one cycle in uh, in the fiber. So, so gamma infinity, um, it's an N minus one dimensional, uh, cycle in, sorry, the mirror to D. Let's just call it each chain. All right, well, actually, sorry, I, I know exactly what it is in um, W minus one of, let's, let's say one. I mean, it doesn't matter if I put one or A or B one. Okay. All right, so far so good. So we have, so we have some, some cycle. So we have some N minus one cycle here, N minus one cycle here. We have a way of going from one to the other. What could we possibly do? <laughs> Audience participation time to shine. What can we possibly do? Or we, ju we just link them together. It's really the natural thing, right? So we have a tropical, we have a cycle here and n minus one cycle here and n minus cycle, one cycle here. We just join them up um, and then it gives us a cycle here. This is a cycle which is fibered in S1 to the N minus two over a tropical two cycle, which is this one. So that's exactly what we wanted. Remember, I told you the key idea is we want to find some cycles which are fibered over some tropical cycles. And then our theorem is, well, well you, you compute it, and then you get you get something which is a generating function of maximal tangency invariance, and then you get like this extra topological term. So basically, you take the cycle, um, you you integrate it. I mean, you can kind of ignore the the, um, the exponential, the, this term, but what's really important is we get this integral over a generating function of maximal tangency invariance. So I purposely didn't write down exactly what this is because that's still work in progress. Um, but this thing you should think of. Uh, this is a generic function um, of maximal tangency for a variance that meet um, a curve in the divisor in, in one third of maximal tangency. Because if you go to higher dimensions, you know, compared to Tim's talk, the virtual dimension will go up. So we need some conditions, and the conditions will be meeting a curve inside the divisor in a maximal tangency in one third. Um, anyways, but, but somehow I can, yes? And for so for B2, uh, the tropical cycle would be a choice of, of, uh, of Z of integer, like going around. Like, correct, correct. That's like the choice of how much going around the integer. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So, so let's do P2 now. Um, oh. Exactly. So, so yeah, no, 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 but that's, that's awesome. It means you paid attention. <laughs> happy, so, happy to hear. So exactly. So for P2, um, we, all we can choose here is we can choose to go around a bunch of times. So I'm just going to choose to go around once because more than once we get seasick. Um, and then, and then you get this vibration. So in the case of P2, you can actually just like go to a critical point because we know what, what it means. So, so you can just close it up somewhere, right? I mean, whether we do or not is, is not important, but we may as well. And then we get this special cycle gamma. And, and here in the case of P2, we can say a little bit more. Yeah. So, so, so just, I, I hope you understand, you know, like, okay. even if you are completely lost, but you know what this B means, I can tell you what the cycle gamma is. So here we take um, here we take w minus one of one, and then we we have this this is a like this thing here is a Lagrangian left shed spindle. Yeah. So the x t admits a is it admits a vibration in elliptic curves, some of which are nodal, out of the like um, critical points of this or, or, of this vibration, come out these. Um, Left shed spindles that end on vanishing cycles of some some like um, um, of, of these elliptic fibers. I mean that's that's a very classical thing. Uh, and now this this gamma here, so it's a Lagrangian left shed spindle. It is homologic. Is it is the homological dual homological mirror symmetry dual to the structure sheaf of P two minus C. So 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 it's really the thing. If you know homological mirror symmetry, maybe it's not the time to talk about it. But it's exactly the thing that you would expect corresponds to, 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 to this sheet, yeah? So it's a Lagrangian that corresponds to this sheet. So, that has, so we are in good shape, yeah? But even, even more, we can say even more, which is that in the case of P2, due to recent work of Collins, Jacobs, Jacob or Jacobs and Lin, um, P2 minus E admits a map to B. So they take it to R2, but, but really we should think about it as B, which is a tropicalization. This is the special Lagrangian vibration that um, Tim started his talk with. So they actually constructed, yeah. they actually reconstructed. And then on the mirror side, they construct the moment map and then um, gamma and P2 minus E have this beautiful relationship that um, the, the image under the moment map of gamma is equal to the tropicalization of P2 minus E. And it's really this perfect like SYZ correspondence. Yeah? And even better, oh, so so this is also a you know it's a so so gamma is a section of the moment map. So so uh, gamma, oops. So it's a section, section of section. I'm just gonna call it section. Um, and what section is it? Well, it's a section you get if you apply intrinsic mirror symmetry. Um, to like the positive real locus. So the analogy is that every toy variety has inside it um, some topological space, which is homeomorphic to the polytope you know, of the toy variety. And, and if you do that thing, but just like souped up in Grossibert, that's what your gamma is. Yeah? So it's really, it's kind of has all these nice, beautiful properties. It's, it's always been there waiting for us to talk about it. <laughs> Patiently. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay. So then now, now you you I started my talk by telling you, well, there's an A side, there's a B side, we have A model invariants, we have B model invariants, and they're supposed to be equal. And now I talked a lot, but still you don't know what's going on. So this is what's going on. In the case of P2 and E, so this is for P2E. We have this, well, well, it's written here. We have this beautiful cycle gamma, which is, you know, really very, very kind of intrinsic cycle. So if you integrate the homomorphic volume form over it, you can compute exactly what it is. And this is what it is. So there's a term in log square. And then we, we get our beautiful, nice uh, generic function of maximum tangency log homomorphic invariance. And somehow it just, it, it just pops out very naturally. That, that's kind of what's beautiful about it. We didn't do physics mirror symmetry where you know we un, where we don't understand what's going on and there's like some sort of oh, oh maybe physicists understand. 
but but it's not like there's like an A model, there's a B model, and magic brings them together. No, we compute the integral on the B side, you know, use getting our hands dirty, you know, doing calculus, yeah, and 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 just pops out this beautiful expression. And the way the reason it works is because the vertical ray have these. Then the reason it works is, is Tim's result, right? So the vertical rays are, um, are these like tropical curve that corresponds to the maximum tangency invariance. And when you compute this integral, they, they're just part of the data you need to compute the integral and you compute it and this is what it is. And it's kind of really, uh, I, I like it a lot because it just, you know, it's, it's it kind of explains mirror symmetry, right? Like, like it, this is like the first time I really think I understand what's going on. And so, so to go back to what Ben was saying, um, oh, so, so first let me make a comment. I already made that comment is that if you, instead of little w to wt, you, you would get quasi map invariance. And then the last thing I want to say, and then you can guess why I call it prismatic mirror symmetry, is that so, so to relate back to what Ben was saying yesterday, it's it's really a good idea to look at generating functions instead of individual invariance. What we did today is we, we look at more than just invariance we want. We take the generating functions of all these punctured invariants. And once we have it, by doing this integral, we get exactly the invariance that we want. So now uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to explain to me the title of my talk. And thank you so much. Answers, I want answers. I ask a question. Okay. Um, can you explain a little bit when the first term one half of square mm -hmm. comes from? I'm sure it's like a computation of a uh, on. Yeah. So something I don't understand. Yeah. So so the so the um so the intuition is if you integrate. I mean that's the intuition. I don't. It's not necessarily an explanation. Um. But the intuition is if you integrate over tropical k cycle, you get something log to the k. Um, but now, why why would you expect that? Um, that's your question. Yeah, I, I I don't know if I have a good explanation. So, yeah, I, I don't think I, I mean it's it's a really good question. I hope next time I give you a talk, I'll have a good explanation. Yeah. Um, so I just I can just the the basically the yeah the, the heuristics if you integrate on case cycle you, you get this but uh, I don't have a better explanation. I mean, if you have off some like locks there just by if you have the exponent just have some some three factor right that um some function then maybe yeah maybe it's something. Maybe yeah yeah it's a yeah yeah I, I yeah that's I I need to look into this. Um so there's a question on the chat. Uh, what is the gluing data as an element of? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so the gluing data, um, so this was this S. So this was just basically a power series in T. Um, where do we have it? So the way we get this S is it's the product over the um, on the so the, the, the wall costing functions of undirected uh, um, walls. So it's Undirected walls here, and those are exactly the ones that came from vertical walls, right? It's and yeah, and that's the gluing data. And so, what, so, so the reason it works like this is this goes back to the earlier work of Rudat and Siebert, where they find that well, when they do this integral, the all the kind of all the walls which have a direction don't contribute to it, but the walls which are not directed they contribute uh, to it, namely in terms of the gluing data. So, so, so therefore, so, the, so it's just, this is a product of, of some power series in T. And then, you know, so what we're still working on is showing that, well, that thing here, um, I mean, that thing here is definitely ex, um, described in terms of, um, it's definitely described in terms of uh, punctured invariance, but that it is exactly the, like the log of written invariance we care about that, that has some need some work. Um, but I mean, not in the case of P2, in the case of P2, in fact, in the case of P2, we have an alternative proof, which is uh, closer to the uh, geometric motivation. 
Uh, this, this is actually gonna appear in the archive like soon. Okay, I don't know, in the month or something. But it's, it's just an introduction, it's kind of a survey paper where we just do this case with a, um, with a different uh, method. Anyways, I hope that answered the question. Thank you for the question, Mark Harden. Yes? Is, is that a notion for you, or if there's anything about the period of T non zero, meaning can I think of it as a period in T, which is analytic away from zero, and then is this only like an asymptotic series at that at T equal zero? Yeah. Okay, so that, that is an excellent question, and, and I don't have a good answer to that either. Um, so we, we had some discussions about, about this, but, but um, so we, we, at this point, we just think of them as some formal power series, but, but then what exactly is the asymptotics of this? That, 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 I, that That's your question, right? Like how to understand this as an actual function, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and that, that, that we don't know. Uh, I, I'd love to know, actually. I mean, I mean this is, in, in some sense, um, so this, this, what I just talked about, has a life in local mirror symmetry, where uh, this is something like you take, I don't know if it's a tree potential or whatever, but, but like the way you get the invariance from local mirror symmetry, um, you can just, I think it's like, it's like so tree potential, maybe you take some derivatives and then the mirror map or something. I mean, in, in, lo, in local P2, then you know it's explicitly the periods. So there are like some other yeah. function type thing, and then this kind of asymptotic expansion at some large limit. So that's the same thing. This is all the same thing. But then in that case, I know there is a really underlying function yeah. that is defined for any P. And... Exactly. And so the difference, so, so let's think about local P2. Mm -hmm. So we have periods of order two and periods of order one, right? And then the period of order one, the inverse gives us the mirror map, right? Mm -hmm. And then now we take the mirror map and plug it in in the period of order two, and that's this thing. So it's kind of right. So, so you know the asymptotics of the like the two periods, but here we did something funny, which is we take the inverse of one period and plug it in in the other. So 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 so, so do you know the asymptotics of that? M maybe you do, but I I I could work something I think I do. Yeah, that, that, I think that, I think we would be very interested in in knowing and understanding that. Um, but somehow, um, so so that so, so yeah, so so that thing can be totally phrased in that language. Um, somehow, the, the the step of taking the the mirror map, we don't have it yet because it's already the coordinates are already intrinsic coordinates. On the other hand, if you took instead of little w the super potential. And this is a proper superpotential. It's not x plus y plus one over x y. It's a, it's a, it's another power series. Mm -hmm. But if you did that one, then you would get exactly the order two period. So yeah. So which is, which yeah. So so we should definitely discuss this out because because I mean there's there's a bunch of interesting stuff here, and, and, and just to make the relationship. Um. So so if you, maybe the one you're familiar with is like for you the mirror of P two. Is maybe an alpha an elliptic vibration, right? And mm -hmm. um, where you so so it's like the same thing except you remove like points here, right? You you remove three sections, and so this is a compactification and reparameterization of that. Mm -hmm. And so the new parameter is the natural parameter from the point of, view of this story, but the way it relates to like the parameter you're used to is the mirror map. Um, and then the periods, this is the other two period. And, and then this comment I made is because we're already in canonical coordinates, um, if you integrate over the order one period, you get something monomial instead of like the inverse of the mirror. Yeah, so there's lots of cool stuff going on here. I don't know where I should start. Yeah, so let's, let's discuss this further. Um, more questions? Is there oh. the chat is showing two? One more time? There are two showing on chat. Are there any more questions there or are there ones more? Oh, seen? yeah, so, so, so I, I saw it and, and so, so that's why I answered it, but I think it's yeah. It's, oh, okay. yeah. yeah, we were not. Yeah. Okay. Anymore? Yes. Uh, the standard question. Yeah. Um, is there any chance you can figure out what the same year equation? Um, 
They have an idea of what you put there and what else you do with these big cube refinements on the right hand side. Oh, okay. So, so just one more time. So, of course, this is the, the, the mandatory question. Thank you for, for asking it. I was waiting for. <laughs> so, your question is what is the cube refinement of this? Um, yeah, so like on the, on the period side. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I I don't put physicists. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I don't know if Cyril wants to take that question. <laughs> so basically, I know that physicists know, but I I I have I'm I, I don't know exactly what it. I mean, I think like you know, there's like some sort of Picard Fuchs equation in the classical case, and then in the refined case, we have some difference equation, which is like a quantization of the Picard Fuchs equation. But I'm just I'm just saying words that I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe you have you, you have something to that. But but there is something, there is something. Um, it's a good question. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Sarah.